Manitoba is the only university that graduates students with a master's degree. Um, and we will have Dana presenting this. Yes, so these are the um, eligibility requirements for this year's application cycle. So the first requirement is that you are a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Secondly, you need to be a graduate of a four-year bachelor's degree. I will let you know that it doesn't necessarily have to be a science degree. It can be any degree that you are passionate about or anything that you want to learn about. So I think that's something that's very unique about this program, and it does allow the acceptance of many different backgrounds. If um, you did not do your degree from a Canadian or approved country, then you will be doing the English language proficiency test. Looking at the minimum GPA requirements, the minimum to apply for the graduate studies is a 3.0 out of 4.5 in your last 60 credit hours. Going back to not needing to have a science degree, you can do any degree again, but you do need to have the three minimum um, courses. So this is human anatomy, human physiology, and biochemistry. And when I applied, I believe you did need to have a grade of at least a B plus in all of those courses. So no matter what degree you do, you do have to take those classes. You will have to write the CASPER exam and then also complete a CV or a resume, a statement of intent, and then also have two letters of recommendation. So two different references that will like write you letters. And then just the preferred criteria. So the program does prefer uh, students from Manitoba as well as rural residents. A competitive um, GPA for the program is a 3.5 of a 4.5. And the program does um, include psychology and microbiology as absent courses. So they are not necessarily needed, but it will definitely help you once you are accepted into the program and you are a first year student. All right. So um, but before we get to the uh, deadlines and the timeline, we actually got additional tips directly from Ian Jones, who is the MPATH program director. He clarified that although the minimum GPA is 3.0 uh, out of 4.5, previous students have had GPAs greater than 3.5. An academic CV that is less than four pages is recommended. He emphasized the importance of the originality of the statement of intent to make sure you have proofread it and that he recommends getting it reviewed by a critical friend. Also make sure to get the program's name correct so it's not masters, it's master of PA studies. In terms of MMI, uh, Ian has confirmed that on-campus MMI will not occur at U of M. Note that programs can change the nature of the questions asked during the MMI. He does not recommend over-rehearsing for MMI as it should be natural and reflective. And when you are responding to questions, ensure you clarify what is being asked, use personal experiences, offer and recognize opposing views, and conclude with the, this is what I would do statement. Lastly, keep responses to four to five minutes when possible. So thank you, Ian, for that. And then Laura will go through the timeline. I do just want to say thank you so much to uh, Alexandra, who runs the Alex Pre-PA pre account, who created these great infographics for us today. Yeah, so the University of Manitoba's program, the general outline is as followed. Again, as Prada explained, these do vary year to year, um, depending on circumstances, especially with COVID, it was slightly different for our um, admission year. Um, essentially, you write your CASPER exam and have all your supplemental application, CV, resume, and statement of intent is all due, as well as your references by January 15th. Um, MMI interviews, um, the invitations are usually sent out around mid-March. The actual interviews will take place around early to mid-April, and acceptances are sent out around mid-May. And then our program started in the very last week of August, but around September is when the program will start. I do just want to preface all these deadlines. They are approximations only. They are not a definitive timeline, just approximations. So next is the McMaster Physician Assistant Education Program that graduates students with a Bachelor of Health Sciences, Health Sciences degree. Selena will be going over the requirements. So we'll start with U of M application components. 
So one thing that is unique to U of M applications is the completion of the CAS uh, online test called CASPER. CASPER stands for Computer-Based Assessment for Personal Sampling Personal Characteristics. It is a situational judgment admissions test developed by researchers at McMaster, which aims to measure traits such as professionalism, ethics, communication, and empathy. CASPER is comprised of 12 sections, eight of which are video-based, four of which are word-based scenarios. Each scenario is followed by three questions that you have five minutes to respond to. The questions may or may not be directly related to PAs, but are more about how you react in ethical dilemmas. The test takes from 75 to 90 minutes long to complete, and the difference being an optional 15 minute break in between. If you haven't already, make sure to sign up for your CASPER test as there are only a few dates available, the last being January 5th for this application cycle. So our U of M students include Dana and Laurel. However, Olivia was also accepted into the program, so she will be answering questions as well. So the first question is, did you use preparation books? Dana, you can start. Yeah, so when I first wrote my CASPER exam, I did use some books. So the BMO CASPER prep book, I found very, very, very insightful. It broke down not only what the test was, but kind of uh, sample questions and how to format answers. Other books that I did use, I read Doing Right. Um, I actually was gifted that book. I don't think it's necessarily essential for CASPER. Um, but it did give me a very good um, insight into different ethical dilemmas and kind of how to approach that. So I did find it useful. And then another resource I used was the University of Washington's bioethics page. So um, if you haven't been in school for a while or you never took an ethics class, I found that was very easy. It broke down some very common ethical dilemmas and kind of ways to approach it. So I found that all very helpful for the exam. Laurel? Yeah, so similar to Dana, I also use the BMO books. I use the Casper Prep, and I believe there was an MMI one as well that was similar, and I read them at the around the same time. Uh, and again, I second what Dana says, um, understanding the basics of medical ethics, bioethics is really important. Um, fortunately, I took some medical ethics courses through my nursing degree. So I didn't read, do any additional reading for that, but um, the U of W sounds like a great resource I would, I would suggest. And Olivia. So I wanna preface my preparation being that I am a very type A personality and I'm the type of person that I need to read every book on the planet in order to feel confident moving forward. That being said, I used a lot of resources for both Casper and MMI, but it's not necessary to do all of this depending on your personality type and maybe your experience and how you feel overall heading into this application cycle. But if you are like me and you like to prepare, I found the BMO Casper prep book very helpful specifically for Casper based answers because it is a typed um, test compared to the MMI that is more verbal generally. As well, reading Doing Right was also very helpful to get a good framework for the ethical component because similarly, Casper and MMI are basically asking the same types of questions. So if you're going to read Doing Right, you might as well read it before Casper just to get a head start on your MMI prep. The MMI for the Mind, I also read, but found it was very repetitive, the demo book. So you can probably pick and choose one or the other, MMI for the mind, or the BMO Casper or MMI Press. Awesome. Next question, did you have a practice schedule? So my schedule, it was very, um, it wasn't specific. I didn't set it out like one day every week. Um, just whenever I had time, I was working full time at the time when I was practicing. So whenever I had a little, a few hours, I would just kind of go over a few questions, um, read through the books kind of at my own pace. And then about a week before the test, I did more practice exams um, and more, more tests up to that. But before that, it wasn't an actual schedule for me. Yeah, I would say similar to Dana, um, I was still in my nursing program while I was going through the application cycle, so it was a little bit difficult for me to find ample time to prep. Um, so I 
believe I scheduled mine after my final exams in December, and it was about two weeks uh, into my break that I wrote the exam. So I think I really crammed in the two weeks of practice um, just because that was what my schedule allowed. So my practice schedule was very informal, October, I would say, starting to think about these things, reading books and such. And then I really kicked things up end of December in January. Probably the most helpful thing for me was closer to the date of Casper was to actually do mock Casper exams that you can find online or make yourself and then go back and reread over your answers or even send your answers to a friend to look over which really simulates not only the type of questions, but also that anxiety because Casper has such a short time limit that that's definitely a part of the test that you want to prepare for. Did you practice with others? Dana? Yeah, so I just actually want to kind of take a step back. So something that I did last year that I found extremely beneficial is I actually made a group on Facebook and I just called it, I think like pre-PA U of M or something like that. And I had a bunch of students join it. Olivia was actually one of them. That's how we became close last year. Um, but what having this group did was it allowed us to talk about the application process and start working through each segment of the application together. So as a group, we tackled Casper, we tackled the MMIs when it came around. So having that group and having people going through it was so beneficial. So yes, I did practice with others. I practiced with Olivia and a few other people in the group. And what we did was we would kind of just bring up an ethical dilemma something that might be similar to a Casper exam question and we would just talk it out so it was a little bit different talking it out um, but it was very very insightful to hear what other people thought um, I think a huge thing about PA is we all come from different backgrounds we all have different life experiences so the way that we approach these questions is very different so hearing what Olivia would say to a question versus what I was thinking it definitely started to expand my horizons and I actually actually think that helped a lot with Casper because I started to look at different viewpoints. So if you're able to form a group, definitely do it. And another thing we did, we would uh, like put a question in the chat and type like five minutes, type out your answers, and then we would compare. So that kind of made sure we were hitting the points that are definitely essential to hit, but also um, different viewpoints between the members. So if you're able to practice with others, definitely do so. It's very, very helpful. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't find that group. Um, <laughs> no, I think that um, it's really important. I, I didn't find other people to practice with. I guess this isn't a complete answer, but I did practice with um, my husband. I would type out um, my answers and have him read them, which was really helpful because especially in a typed situation, sometimes when you reread what you've written, you realize, oh, that came across in a way that I, I didn't intend. Uh, so for Casper prep, I would strongly suggest practice typing both for speed and to also take the time to review what you've written to ensure that you're coming across in the way that that was intended. Um, further to that, I personally came up with a bit of a format of how I was answering questions. Um, which was really helpful in those high stress situations. You have all of these thoughts running through your head. Um, it's great to have a method of how you want to convey them on paper. So um, the, the books did help with that significantly. Just to reiterate, yes, practicing, I practiced with Dana and found that extremely helpful, but I also from practice groups closer to MMI with Casey as well, who's on the call. So. I found it really helpful to make sure you're having a balanced perspective because again, if you're practicing by yourself, you think you're answering things right, but then you hear different opinions from different people and you learn that maybe there are different approaches to answers that are all right, but you wanna make sure you're hitting a balanced perspective of all of them. Awesome. So um, after each application component, there will be a list of relevant pre-asked questions from the audience that our students uh, will answer. So um, Dana, Laurel, and Olivia, if you can answer these two questions. And um, again, I'm just going to remind everyone, for panelists, if we can keep answers to one, one minute, just because we have had some technical difficulties, so we do have, have to keep things short. But uh, if you can go ahead and answer. Sure. I can, so, oh, Olivia, you go. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can answer the first question since I wrote Casper and then had MMIs at Mac and U of M. So essentially Casper is a typed 
uh, exam that is a situational judgment test versus an MMI. It's typically more verbal answers, but can also have written answers. I would say that they are similar in terms of preparation, but the types of questions are going to vary slightly for each. I found that CASPER was more general, more situational versus because the CASPER exam is sent out to many different programs versus the MMI was very specific to, for example, medical ethical questions. It can also be more vague in terms of communication or even role playing if you are in person. So those are the main differences, but they are similar in terms of your preparation. All right, and then should I have already booked my CASPER test? Um, I'll just go ahead and answer that. Probably yes, um, as I showed earlier on, uh, there are only a couple more spots for a um, couple more dates for the CASPER test to book in order to be eligible for this coming round. So please make sure you go do that as soon as you can. All right, so next thing is the CV resume. So U of M gives an option to use either, either a CV or a resume, but CV tends to be used for grad school and to show education, research, and expertise, while resumes tend to be used for jobs and to highlight work experience and related accomplishments. Ian Jones did say that an academic CV is well received, so keep that in mind. Um, the PDF I linked here is um, gives, it's actually by U of M and it gives great examples of all kinds of CVs such as standard medicine related, so please make sure to check that out. So first question, how many pages did you guys use? Yeah, so mine was four pages. I think Prada mentioned earlier, that's probably the max. Um, again, just use your discretion for any of this. Mine was four pages. I also included certificates. So it actually ended up being a lot more than four pages. Um, but generally just write all the information you think it would need and don't use these as like standards exactly. Um, but I, mine was four pages. Laurel. Yeah, mine was two. Um, it was the same resume I would use for a job application, just slightly tweaked towards um, uh, focusing more on my educational uh, background. Awesome. Olivia? Mine was three. Um, I think initially it was closer to four or five, and I really had to work on condensing it. Um, but yeah, the shorter the better, because um, admissions committees don't want to read through pages and pages of your CV. For sure. And what headings did you use? Yeah, so mine are just listed there. I talked about my education. I talked about previous employment that I had, volunteering that I have done and I do, extracurricular activities, and also shadowing experiences specific to the University of Manitoba. Yeah, and again, as Dana said, mine are, are highlighted there. Essentially, I just started with a bit of a blurb about me, um, a professional statement, if you will. Um, and then I went into my education certifications and experience. Um, I just chose to reformat mine a little bit, highlighting in the first couple headings what I thought the PA um, admissions committee would want to see. So highlighting my experience as a paramedic and my education as a nurse. And Olivia? So as listed on the slide, I talked about my education. I decided to lump my work and volunteer experiences together because I didn't have a lot of professional uh, work experience. So I just combined those categories. I also listed my professional development, like being a member of Toastmasters, for example, um, publications from my job as a research assistant, select athletic honors, and then presentations that I gave over the past few years. And how many bullet points did you use for each experience? Yeah, so I actually, um, I did paragraphs. I kind of described each experience in more of a paragraph form. So I actually didn't use bullet points. Laurel? Yeah, I was a bit more of a bullet point person. I had about five, roughly, give or take, for each section. But uh, my education and certification section was a little bit more in depth. Yep, so mine was, sorry, mine was similar to Laurel, um, between three to 10 bullet points, depending on how much information you needed. And did you have an objective statement? Yep, I just had one right at the beginning. Yeah, I did as well. I did as well. And I do believe that Ian said that, that uh, an objective statement is also well received. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, Pre-asked questions about CV resume, should I list additional references on my CV or resume? I can take a crack at that one. I don't think it's necessary to list additional references um, because the references are submitted separately and that's actually through the supplemental application online. You'll list your references as well as their email. So everything will go through there. Um, so I don't believe it would be necessary to list additional references in my opinion. All right, so moving on to the next component. So the statement of intent is a maximum 1,000 word essay that should answer the four questions posted on the right. So this is for, again, the current application cycle. Um, Ian Jones, again, the MPAS program director, stressed the importance of making the personal, the statement personal. Um, using third parties to, uh, to help you write it, it may buy, backfire. And keep in mind that this statement will be checked for plagiarism. Uh, during the registration, 81% of you said this is where you would like um, the most help in. So let's get started with the questions. So what format did you all use and how many paragraphs did you use for your statement of intent? Yes, yeah, so with my statement of intent, I told a story throughout the entire statement, um, making sure that every single question was answered. So I didn't necessarily split it up question by question. Instead, I kind of just told my story and then made sure it was very clear when I was answering those questions. Yeah, similar to Dana, I think that that's um, what I did as well. I talked about myself and my upbringing and my personal story and I ensured that if I was answering a question that was specific um, per the application page I would you know ensure that I used some of the wording of the question uh, in my response so it was very clear that I was answering all of those questions and um, how many paragraphs yeah as it says there about six including a introduction and closing So I took a little bit of a different approach. I used a complete essay style. So with an introduction, a conclusion, each question was a different paragraph because all of my stories didn't sort of like mesh together to answer the questions perfectly. So I just sort of separated it out. I think it came out to six to eight paragraphs. Why did you pick the PA profession as that is something that is um, kind of a question for this statement of intent? Yeah, so I definitely went into more detail about why I chose PA in my statement than what is listed here. Um, but generally, the impact that PAs can have on patients individually, and I've been able to see how that can impact communities. I am from rural Manitoba. I lived about two hours north of Winnipeg for a few years of my life as well. So I was able to see the introduction of a PA into that community and the positive impact they were able to make. So that had a huge impact on why I chose PA. Also being able to practice medicine in a team-based environment. If you can't tell, I love to talk. I love to meet people. I love building relationships. So that aspect of the profession definitely stood out to me. Um, so building relationships and then advocacy, I think that's a huge part of my life. And I think that's a huge part of the profession. So everything kind of checked off all the boxes for me. Yeah, so I didn't uh, really have any exposure to the PA profession um, before I was in my nursing degree and throughout my clinical rotations. I That's where I was first exposed to PAs working in hospital. Um, I didn't know what they did. So I spent a lot of time talking to them and asking what exactly their role was and how they got into that profession. Um, definitely intrigued me um, as I was always planning to do a master's degree. And I think naturally, I just thought that I would do the NP stream. Um, but what was a bit of a factor in my decision for PA versus NP was that I am a bit of an older student. I have a family. Um, I wanted to be able to complete my education in a timely manner as well. And so being able to enter the PA program right after my nursing degree was uh, a huge benefit for me. Further to that, um, being able to provide high level uh, interventions to patients, um, more complex high acuity care, was also something that has always interested me about being a medical provider. So um, I think that it really balanced my experience as a paramedic in making clinical decisions um, in a very autonomous manner, as well as my nursing experience. Um, the PA profession just seemed like the perfect fit for me. 
And for me, I have a variety of reasons. The first being that I was a patient in a life-threatening car accident in 2016. And from this experience, I really appreciated the difference of high quality patient-centered care. And that really inspired me to do the same for my patients moving forward and to be part of a profession that takes the time to listen to the patient's concerns. And PA was a big part of that for me. Next, working on a team based on my experience in Olympic level windsurfing, I loved working together with other athletes and training partners and to transfer this into the PA profession was a huge reason for me to go into it. Advocating for others, whether that be patients, advocating for the profession or for your own learning opportunities as a physician assistant was another big point, as well as probably the most important point being the sustainable solution to several healthcare crises like physician burnout or healthcare inaccessibility. I am a firm believer in being part of something that creates a positive change in society. And so that's a huge reason I decided to become a physician assistant. All really great reasons. Next question is why did you select or why did you want to apply to y, uh, U of M? Yeah, so I only applied to the University of Manitoba and that's where I gained acceptance. So for me, I was born and raised in Manitoba. I've always lived here. Um, I also did my undergraduate degree at the University of Manitoba. I found the institution to be extremely professional. I had such a great experience in my undergrad there. So it definitely made sense to continue my educational endeavors with the same institution. The faculty itself is so supportive. I was able to tell that before I even gained admission into the program. Um, just going through the application process, everything was streamlined. Everyone was so amazing and small class size. So the program, there's 15 of us within the first like two hours of meeting each other, we became like a little family. Um, so so that was huge for me just because like at U of M and undergrad, there was like 500 people in the class and now we're down to 15. We know everybody's life, everyone's stories. And it's just so great to have like 15 other best friends now. Uh, yeah, for me, U of M, um, I was already familiar with the institution. That's where I did my nursing. I currently live in Manitoba, so I didn't really have the option or will to move. Um, you know, I have a family here, so doing a program in a different province just simply wasn't an option for me. Um, but above and beyond that, I really do appreciate the small class size and my new little family and um, being in a master's level degree program um, allows you the opportunity to do a research um, component in where you may have the opportunity to be published at one point. So that was definitely an intriguing factor for me as well. So to reiterate both Dana and Laurel, um, the smallest class size in Canada, as well as the research-based master's degree. And the third point is the spiral curriculum, which I'm sure Dana and Laurel can speak to better than I am because I'm currently at Mac. But my understanding is that at U of M, they start at a basic level foundation and all of these different courses and then build upon it as the year progresses. So that was one of the uh, features that attracted me to U of M. Awesome. I can speak to that, Olivia. It absolutely is a spiral, spiral curriculum. Um, in our first month, we took biochemistry, so we learned a lot about acid and bases um, at kind of a basic level. Now we're in physiology, and guess what's back? Acid and bases at a different level. And I'm assuming next semester, it'll just keep building and building. So we're already fully exposed to that, but it's a great way to learn. So if that's something that works for you and you like adding on to that, U of M is definitely uh, very good for that. Awesome. So next question, what community involvement did you discuss? So the community involvement that I kind of touched on, I had volunteer, I still volunteer at a community health clinic in Winnipeg. So just my experiences there, what I've learned, how it shaped me, what it makes me want to do in the future. I also talked about my position being a speaker for a mental health organization called Jack.org. So I was able to kind of discuss what that means to me, why I'm doing that. And then I also discussed my position working at HealthLinks in Fusante in Manitoba, um, how amazing of an organization that is, and especially during COVID, what we were able to do. So those were kind of what I discussed, obviously in more detail, but 
Um, for me, I focus my community involvement around my work as a paramedic. Um, as I've been working and going to school for the past four years, I didn't really have too much time to volunteer on top of that, but I did spend some time doing some volunteer um, camp nurse positions up at Camp Arnaz. Um, and I've been doing some medical volunteering here and there throughout the past decade or so at different events and, and whatnot. So yeah, most of my community involvement uh, highlighted my work as um, a rural paramedic in Manitoba, as well as northern regions. So for my community involvement, I tried to pick specific positions where I learned something or developed a skill that would be transferable to the PA profession. So with that being said, I selected a few things such as being a windsurfing coach, a marketing supervisor for a health promotional campaign at Queens, which was a volunteer position, as well as being a research assistant and volunteer at Canadian Blood Services. All right, so now we're gonna, going to get to the pre-ask questions. So again, just due to time, we'll try to briefly touch on these. Um, so first question, how did you relate your work and volunteer experiences to the PA program? So we'll get one person to answer that. Um, I can I can go for that. I think that mine is very relevant. So I mean, maybe I'm not the best person to answer just because um, it yeah, my work and volunteer experience is all medical related. And so luckily, I was able to really link that and my experiences. Um, you know, for example, I, I did talk a lot about my experience with the shortages of physicians in rural Manitoba and the impact that that has on um, patients and healthcare providers and how it's important to highlight how PAs can really be a great solution to fill that gap. So having that background and knowledge of what the PA profession can provide was really helpful. Beautiful. A question we got from audience was, I've heard that it's often good to pick a theme or focus for an application, such uh, i.e. a specific driving force or goal for your pursuit as a PA. Do you think showing a specific interest in one area is better than touching on many areas? I can try to answer this one. So for me, I personally decided to focus on a bunch of areas because I consider myself to be a well-rounded individual and have a lot of different elements that I want to touch upon to present the most, most authentic version of myself in my application. So I would say that it depends on how you want to present yourself, but if you find that picking a theme presents yourself in a way that's most authentic to you, then you should do that. But it all sort of depends on um, what sort of what sort of personality you have and what sort of experiences you bring to the table. And last question we had was for those who had a lower GPA, did you discuss this in your statement of intent? So I can answer this. Um, I'll kind of do more of a spin on it. So I I didn't discuss lower GPA, but something that I think is very important is discuss anything that you think is relevant. If you had a life event or you struggled in your first year and you started doing well or you improved your grades, discuss it, bring it to the table. I think it shows that you can um, grow from from your first year. Um, something that I did discuss was that I was a reapplicant to the program. So I did mention, you know, the differences that I had made or what had changed. So I think in relation to having a lower GPA, you can definitely do the same. If you don't feel like you need to address it, then of course don't use your discretion. But for people that do have a lower GPA, if you want to discuss it and you feel like it is relevant and it shows any strengths that you have gained, then I think it definitely could be worth mentioning in your statement. Awesome. So the next uh, thing is letter of recommendation. So U of M requires two. One must be from a professional, but both have to be from individuals who have current knowledge of your uh, attributes and suitability for medicine. You cannot use family or any extended family members. During the application form, you can input their contact information, which will send the references a link to fill out online. The references you use have an option to also send in a letter, but they do not need to. You can also refer to U of M admissions bulletin for information about letters of rec. So who did you use as a reference? 
So one thing I want to say, um, I think that people can get caught up on trying to use someone with a high title, feeling like they need to use a professional. Um, for me, I just wanted to use who knew me, who could speak to my attributes, my strengths, and who knew me best. So I actually worked at a golf course for five years. Um, my manager there knew me very, very well. So I used him as a reference. And then I also was able to work directly in collaboration with a nurse over the last year. So I was able Able to use her as a reference as well and they were able to kind of see me in different situations stressful situations so they were able to talk to my attributes there and then connect it to why I would make a good PA. Yeah, for me personally, I used uh, the first person I used is my education supervisor from my job as a paramedic. Um, they were very familiar with the PA profession, really um, appreciated and valued the importance of higher level of education and they even themselves wanted to consider that as a career. So um, I thought that was really important. I think that whoever is chosen really needs to have a good understanding of what a PA is and what kind of personality traits um, are required to, to work in, in the medical field. Um, the other person that I used was my clinical coordinator from my second year nursing placement. Kind of an odd connection there just because we didn't have a lot of direct um, supervision in, in our relationship. However, there was a lot of personal conversations that went through, um, you know, that we discussed about my, my goals in, in applying to the PA program. Um, and I just ended up talking to her quite a lot about, you know, how I was feeling and, and why I was exploring this as a profession. So I feel that she got a lot of feedback from my direct supervisors of how I was doing in my nursing degree as well as had that personal connection. But I will just say that I think in general, it's really important with your references to whoever you ask, um, schedule a meeting with them to sit down and discuss what a PA is, what, why you want to be a, be a PA, what the application entails, the competitiveness of the program. I feel like that just really helps them, you know, be drawn into the application process with you and almost want you to succeed. Like, oh, it's so crazy competitive. I really want to root for you. And, and that just, it helps. So yeah, I think that's important. So for me, I first got my letter of reference from my uh, manager as a research assistant, who I briefed on what a PA was and sort of what elements they could speak to in their letter. And then my second reference was actually an alternate. So I was planning on getting a reference from my manager when I was a clinical intern at a naturopathic clinic, but she was super busy with COVID related things and declined um, the ability to do so. So I had to kind of scramble and find a backup. So I asked my coach, my strength and conditioning coach, who had known me for three years to write this letter. And it was sort of a wild card, um, but he knew me very well. He knew my work ethic. He could really write a letter from a personal level, which I think played a big part. And I did take time to bring him up to speed on what a PA is, what this program entails, and what to touch upon in the letter. When did you ask for references? So I had been working with both my references. Um, again, I was the reapplicant, so I actually used one of the same references. Um, so they they knew it was coming. We kind of discussed it on and off between October, and November, uh, when I was going to finally submit it, so they could do it. Um, so I asked officially in December, and of course it was due January fifteenth. So. I feel like that was hopefully enough time. They knew since about October that it would be coming though. Yeah, I really think it's important to at least have a discussion early on um, and then tell them that you'll keep in touch and that when it gets closer to the application time, what would, they, what would be expected of them? I really wanted to ensure that they had theirs submitted before the Christmas holidays, just because I know that that's a really busy time for people, especially people who are celebrating um, Christmas. And I really didn't want to be bugging them like January 1st about uh, getting that letter in. Um, and I, so I wanted to make sure as well for me, that also means that you need to have your part of the application done before you can, because the reference is uh, the last part of the application. So your whole application has to be complete before you can um, send out those invitations for them. I, I believe if I'm remembering that correctly. So I think that's important. 
I'm just going to jump in here because I'm actually doing the U of M application and you can actually put in your references earlier. So I'm still working on my statement of intent and um, other application components, but I have sent out one of my references already um, because it's a link. So you can actually get it sent out earlier. Just to answer the question. So I asked in October and I do recommend starting early because like I said, somebody um, declined for me and you kind of had to scramble and find a backup. So definitely get onto that if, if you haven't. All right, so I did skip one of the questions just due to time, um, but uh, let's go through the pre-asked questions. So for Manitoba references, should one be academic and one professional? I would like to use two professional, but I am scared that it would hurt my chances. Um, I guess I can speak to this. I didn't use an academic reference. Um, I just graduated last year, so we were online with COVID. I didn't really have an opportunity to get to know uh, professors or any academic people in person. I also didn't do research in my undergrad, so that kind of, I didn't um, have any connections to any academic faculty or staff at that time. So I personally used two professional references and I was accepted with those. Awesome. Is it better to have two great references from one place or one from a different place that you don't know as well? I mean, I tried it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just and I'm sure you can just jump in as well. Like, I, I think these are kind of difficult questions just in the sense where, again, like we're not on the admissions committee. I think personally, um, it's more beneficial to have two people who could speak to your qualities best. Um, rather than, um, you know, just trying to get diversity um, in, in, mm -hmm. in the reference, uh, references that you use. So whoever knows you best, I feel is more important. And then how would you recommend asking a professor or supervisor for a letter of rec? I could, Olivia would be great to answer this. Sure. So I actually just emailed my um, supervisors asking for a letter because I knew them fairly well that it wasn't necessary to necessarily have a meeting and explain um, this in a formal setting. But that being said, Laurel mentioned she had formal meetings with her supervisors. So I think it really depends on your relationship with them and um, how much information you think you want to share in what format. Awesome. All right. So thank you so much to Dana, Laurel, and Olivia. So that wraps up.